everyone. I'm Erica Gallanton of Sovereignty Herbs and it is uh, just past May Day or the Beltane uh, here in 2021 in the Medicine Gardens in Hocking County, Ohio. And it's been um, a really interesting growing season thus far. We've had a really dry spring actually in, in comparison to previous years. Um, so our mushroom hunting was a little bit sparse this year um, and some of the plants, some of the medicinals and some of the native plants that we have growing uh, have all kind of struggled to really get their, their feet in. But we've just had several days of pretty intense rain and it's incredible how vibrant the gardens have become because of it. And uh, you know, as, as per spring rituals, uh, one of the biggest tasks I think at hand uh, for me as a, a grower of medicinal plants and food crops is really kind of the garden preparation time of year where I'm getting all of the beds ready and getting everything sorted out and organized and cleaned out. And one of the um, challenges I think uh, of, of the spring clean uh, is the weeding. The weeding, or the weeding of some of the kind of banes of a gardener's existence. Um, but what's really interesting about some of these weeds, as tenacious and irritating as they can be in the gardens, um, a lot of them actually have a lot of really wonderful virtues. And so I thought I would take this opportunity to talk to you a little bit about some common weeds um, and maybe some uncommon uses for these weeds so we can learn to have uh, a different appreciation for them, uh, maybe. Uh, instead of just ripping them out of the gardens, we can harvest them from our gardens uh, and make use of their wonderful qualities. I also thought, since it is such an exciting time of year, especially here in, in Southeast Ohio, Appalachian Ohio, that I'd also take the opportunity to show you some of my kind of favorite ephemeral wildflowers that are blooming at the moment as well. So it won't all be weeds. There'll also be some wildflowers. So thank you for joining me and I hope you enjoy. So one of the first tenacious weeds I wanted to talk about is the dandelion. Yes, the dandelion. And many of us know about, you know, you can eat the greens, they're a little bitter, but they are great in salads in the spring. And, uh, you know, herbalists, as herbalists, we actually use the root um, um, for its medicinal purposes, you know, supporting liver function and things like that. You can also ferment with it and, and add it to cooking and stews and whatnot. But one of the aspects mm. of the dandelion that really kind of gets overlooked, I think, is the wonderful virtues of the flower. And I just wanted to take a moment to just really acknowledge the uh, incredible architecture here that nature has created in the dandelion. And I think because it's so common, it's definitely something we take for granted. But when we get up close and we really see how these seeds attach to uh, the seed head with these wonderful arrows that enable them to kind of fly off into the wind and grow and, uh, you know, take over in our gardens. It's really quite incredible. Um, so the other thing I really love about dandelion flowers is the fact that they have wonderful medicinal virtues uh, for the skin as well as for the liver, just kind of supportive. And you know, it's a good harvest day when you've got, you know, the sticky pollens all over your hands. So um, one of the things I like to do with the dandelion flowers is dry them using just a, a normal kitchen dehydrator uh, on your lowest setting, so about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And, um, you know, once the dandelions are dry, the flowers are dry, it usually takes about 24 hours. Um, they can be used for a variety of different fun kitchen projects like herbal vinegars for salad dressings, uh, even infused oils that you can use on your skin, as well as one of my favorite, which is the dandelion mead. This is a honey wine. So I put a recipe for that in the comments down below or in the description down below. And you know that your dandelion flowers are dry when they have this kind of spongy texture. Uh, they're no longer sticky and resinous um, and they really have these kind of frothy white, you know, under 
uh, under color to, to the bright yellow uh, petals. So dandelion flowers are wonderful. Wonderful for bees, wonderful for you and me. Another one of the uh, wildflowers I want to show you, this isn't a weed, this is actually a wonderful native wildflower, is the columbine. This is Aquilegia canadensis. And a lot of us are familiar with some of the horticultural varieties, but this is just a straight species and it's such a delight in the gardens. It's like fireworks, you know, there's like these fireworks going off everywhere this time of year. Really love this plant. And this beauty. My goodness, you guys, if you could smell this right now, you would be in heaven. This is um, a native azalea. This is the pinkster azalea. And um, I, I just, it's a slow growing plant. I've had it in the gardens now for several years. Um, and it's now really just starting to take off these wonderful blooms. I just love this extension of the stamens. And of course, the the incredible aroma that it provides. And it's just beautiful uh, in scent and sight. So one of the most exciting aspects for me of this spring season is watching the um, awakening of all of the pollinators that coincides with this awakening of the plant kingdom again in the spring. And one of the things that I've been really enjoying this season um, being that my gardens uh, and and all of the space has been so full of some of these weeds, um, I've been really enjoying watching, uh, you know, how the honeybees, my husband's honeybees, um, have been foraging on some of these weeds and how much they've been foraging on some of these weeds. Um, there's pollinator plant relationships there that I wasn't aware of uh, really before. Not, not to the extent that I have been this season as I've really been uh, spending some time kind of focusing on these plants and the harvesting and use of these plants uh, from the garden since they were very extensive. So it's been, um, it's been a really interesting exercise in just observation and, and really appreciating the fact that, you know, first thing out of the, out of the season, the bees are awake, they're alive. Um, and they're hungry. And here are all these really tenacious weeds that are really providing a wonderful source of forage for them and nutrition. Um, and how wonderful that is, really, when you think about it. So I've really been enjoying that a lot. The next tenacious weed that I wanted to talk to you about is ground ivy. Uh, glaucoma heteracea, also known as gill over the ground, uh, as you can see here, or creeping Charlie is another fun name for it. So this is a this is a plant that has a wonderful history of use, um, as well as a wonderful history of irritating gardeners to no end. Um, but one of its traditional uses was um, in, uh, in making ale. It, it was used before hops as the as a kind of clarifying agent uh, in ale. But what's really also very interesting about this species is that as herbalists, this is probably one of our greatest allies for the upper respiratory system, especially going, going into the season of the pollening. Uh, it can be incredibly supportive to um, the, the respiratory mucosa. And so, so I tend to use this mostly as a tincture. Um, this is an alcoholic extract that uh, I make and dispense in my clinic. But one of the other great ways of using this wonderful species is in an herbal vinegar. So this is something that you can do at home. And I've put a, a little folk recipe for you in the description there so you can check it out. And, you know, you can add it, uh, you know, to your salad dressings and your marinades. Uh, you can also just take a little teaspoon of it once or twice a day to help support you during the allergy season. And just for fun, I thought I'd show you that there's also this really beautiful variegated variety uh, that's actually not very aggressive and quite lovely in the gardens. So, and this is what it looks like, you know, all harvested up. I've got about two pounds here, which is exciting. Uh, it didn't take me very long to get, and I'm looking forward to tincturing it. All right, so I thought I would show you just some other really beautiful flowers. This is uh, the native blue violet, Viola sororia. 
uh, whose flowers are delightfully edible and wonderful on salads. And this is Jacob's Ladder. It's a polymonium species and uh, not necessarily medicinal or edible, but really just a gorgeous kind of um, woodland wildflower that hangs out here in the gardens. And it would not be a May video without me going on and on and on about my favorite wildflower, the Blue-Eyed Mary. Uh, it is just, to me, one of the most incredible shades of blue that nature provides for us in the spring. And we're really lucky here in our hollow to uh, have the entire bottom uh, filled with Blue-Eyed Mary this time of year. And uh, it's been really interesting watching the bees, um, the honeybees, collect pollen off of the, the flowers. And here they are. Gosh, just a wonderful, delightful color. So the last tenacious weed that I wanted to talk to you about is the purple dead nettle or purple archangel uh, Lamium purpureum. And this is a really wonderful plant. It's got a, a kind of a strong musty scent to it. But again, it's one of these plants that has been traditionally used by herbalists to support the upper respiratory system during the allergy season. Um, and, you know, being a member of a, the mint family, it is an annual, uh, it does kind of self seed everywhere. So if you're looking to, uh, you know, get rid of it in your gardens, uh, one of the best ways of doing that is to just keep harvesting the flowers every year. And I've had, uh, you know, several folks reach out to me and ask me, well, what do you, how do you dry these? What is your process for harvesting and drying these? Uh, because this actually, for me, uh, is it makes a great tea, uh, although you can actually cook with these as well. Um, people steam them, um, you know, like steamed greens. Not my favorite method, but I, I do like the tea. So I just harvest the seed head or the flower heads like this and throw them into a paper bag in a dry room with lots of airflow. And uh, after several days, I keep churning it around and churning it around. After several days, you get this really wonderful kind of dried, spongy, uh, uh, flower heads and uh, I make a tea out of those usually about a tablespoon per cup so thank you so much for joining me today as I went through a, uh, a brief exploration of some of the common garden weeds that uh, can irritate us gardeners, but really uh, are quite lovely for us as herbalists, have a lot of wonderful virtues. I hope you enjoyed the video and I look forward to uh, sharing again with you very soon. Have a wonderful spring.